If a stranger asked me in passing if Warframe was pay to win, I'd say nah, of course not. But if a friend came to me looking to have a conversation about getting into the game and asked about the monetization, I'd say, you see, the thing is, it's kind of pay to win, right? But... No, I'm just kidding, I'm not gonna bait you like that. I'll lay out where I'm coming from right up front. I love Warframe. I've been playing since beta, so 11-ish years now, and I could easily still be playing 11 years from now, so obviously I'm not here to just hate on the game or anything. If you're unfamiliar, this is Warframe's premium currency, Platinum, and I think Platinum is the basis for one of the best free-to-play monetization models in the industry. But I do have a couple of problems with it, and the systems around it that are kind of ruining the game for me a little bit at times. And look, I fully realize my issues might be personal mind goblins to an extent, so you know, just hear me out. I'm not here to ruin your fun, and I'm not just here to talk about monetization either. Like I said, I've been playing for 11 years, and it's really exciting to see so many new and returning players hopping in recently. Even more so considering in a lot of ways, Warframe is in the best place it's ever been. So today, we're going to talk about why, yes, I fully believe Warframe is pay to win, but also why people love this game so much that not only does it being pay to win kind of not matter, but the mere phrase pay to win is enough to start heated arguments in some circles, despite the fact that we can literally walk up to a vendor and buy endgame weapons with the premium currency. You see, Warframe is a true free-to-play game, meaning as far as I'm aware, there isn't any non-cosmetic content in the game that cannot be played entirely for free. All content updates are free, all new frames, weapons, and mods are free. It's just a question of how long you're willing to grind to unlock everything. This is mainly supported by the premium currency Platinum, which is par for the course with a free-to-play game, but where Warframe starts to mix things up a bit is Platinum purchases aren't limited to cosmetics. While you can earn just about everything through grinding, you can also directly purchase almost anything with Platinum. Want a new frame or a weapon? Maybe some overpriced resources? Maybe you want a Nautilus but don't want to spend days farming the Railjack mission so many people hate. Maybe you want the new Tome mod set for the new Grimoire weapon type and our newest frame Dante, well… Only 1.6% of players will get all 8 mods in 20 or fewer Rotation C runs. The real 50% point is at 49 runs with 1 in 10 players needing over 86 runs, or 1 in 100 players needing over 130 runs. Considering a Rotation C run is about 25 minutes, that's a very long time. With the current state of this drop table, I'd highly recommend that you farm Platinum elsewhere and buy the pack from the market. And look, all that doesn't sound great at face value, and at times it's not great in practice. I mean, when the options in front of you are grinding for likely more than 20 plus hours for a few highly specific mods with no real RNG protection or spending a pretty inconsequential amount of plat, as a player you do almost have to wonder if the drop rates are so bad solely for the sake of pushing you to the store, which just never feels like a great gameplay experience. And even if you avoid directly spending on mods or whatever in the microtransaction market, you're gonna need some platinum at some point. Whether that's for key upgrade materials like potatoes, which you'll need a lot of because they're used on everything from weapons to characters, pets, basically everything you apply mods to in-game, and without one you'll be stuck fighting at half strength at best. You might also find yourself buying new inventory slots to store your ever-growing arsenal because you're only given two slots for frames and eight for weapons to get you started, which in a game about collecting things obviously won't be enough forever. And you'll likely also find yourself trading for one of the mini FOMO fueled or time gated items you often have no direct way of grinding for outside of twiddling your thumbs for weeks if not months or spending platinum. And while a lot of this can be obtained in very small amounts from limited time events or the occasional handout from digital extremes, in my experience it's nowhere near enough if you're the kind of player who likes options, a player who has any intention of building out a real arsenal. Platinum's everywhere, and it's entirely unavoidable. Personally, I wouldn't have fun playing Warframe if I didn't use the premium currency, which is kinda an unfortunate thing to have to say about any game. Where Warframe does balance things out a bit though, especially once you reach endgame, is it's actually really easy to earn Platinum totally for free by simply playing the game. You see, you can sell items to other players for Platinum with little more than a few messages in trade chat, or a post on Warframe Market, and it's actually kinda a core part of the gameplay loop in my mind. 
Warframe is a massive game. 11 years of content. No sunsetting here, lads. <laughs> and those tome mods are not an outlier where obscenely low drop rates and a lack of RNG protection are concerned. According to the wiki, there are around 56 Warframes, 578 weapons, 1,336 mods, and there are literally hundreds if not thousands of other things to grind in-game. If you try to farm literally everything yourself, odds are you'll probably hate your life, hate the game, and fall off after dozens of hours spent running the same repetitive content over and over, a decent amount of it being somewhat outdated at this point. So what most of us vets do is farm for what we can and buy or trade for what we reasonably can. Honestly, at this stage, thousands of hours in, I can very comfortably earn a few hundred plat every single week without going out of my way too much, and that's really empowering as a player, whether you're free to play or spending real money. Because to an extent, everything is obtainable, so I rarely feel like anything is truly out of reach. I farmed my hammer shot literally years ago, but if I didn't have one and saw that 1.01% drop rate attached to a time-gated mission type, I could look at that nonsensical farm and just say, No, I don't think I will. And instead, just go spend a couple of hours running around, opening relics, farming arcanes. Heck, a single decent call run can easily generate enough plat to afford hammer shot, and that only takes maybe 30 minutes or so if I'm being slow. When I wanted a Volt Prime for some tribal on hunting, I just woke up one day, farmed for a few hours, spent a couple more in trade chat, and had my Volt Prime before it was lunchtime. Sounds great, right? Easy, too. Well, here's where that mind goblin I mentioned really starts doing a fucking jig, because it's actually too easy, and that's part of the problem. But in order to explain why, let's take a quick detour and talk about why, instead of playing literally anything else, people put up with the microtransactions, the time gating, and this eldritch horror masquerading as a trade chat. DE, please, it's just... <laughs> I've spent dozens, I can't even tell you how many hours I've spent over the last several years just watching trade chat while doing this. We've all been reliant on third party tools for too long and it's time for a proper auction house or something, I don't know, some anything, please. If I were to explain why people love Warframe, of course I could tell you about how the combat is not just flashy but incredibly satisfying with insanely smooth transitions from melee to gunplay. I could tell you about the vast array of classes and weapon types, making practically any and every playstyle you can imagine not just viable, but unstoppable. Or I could talk about how the movement mechanics are so fluid, if you spend any amount of time playing Warframe, practically everything else will feel like wading through quicksand. I could tell you all that, but I don't think I really need to. I mean, I think you can see it for yourself. And I mean, the game is free. If you're interested, trying it will tell you more than I ever could in a very brief aside. So, you know, instead, I kind of want to briefly talk about something that's a bit harder to see, but is in some ways more important than all that. The fact that, in a lot of ways, Warframe is one of the few games to genuinely live up to the promise of live service. Do you ever think about what that concept was originally sold to us as in the modern gaming era? Do you remember a time when OG Overwatch was all anyone wanted to play, before all the patches ran it into the ground? Do you remember a time before Destiny? Live service games were supposed to be ever-evolving living worlds like classic MMOs, your favorite games would never die, the best stories would never end, and you could keep having fun with your friends forever in a game that builds and improves upon itself year over year instead of waiting for sequels. A game that grows alongside you as a player, effectively serving as like a digital third place. However, over time, for a lot of people, the term live service has largely come to imply shallow, online-only, multiplayer-focused repetitive grind fest, where your gear or characters get constantly power crept, that you have to invest time into like a second job to get real value out of, often powered by increasingly predatory business practices, all of which tends to get in the way of games actually being, you know, fun. And even if they manage to be fun, most of these games only last a couple of years at best because they fail to make enough money hand over fist, or they simply fail to maintain concurrent numbers high enough to justify ongoing development. I'm calling it now, end of service announced by this time next year. I hope I'm wrong, I don't think I am. And because of games like this, I have a lot of friends who simply won't even bother to look at most new live services anymore because they've been burned so many times, the phrase live service may as well translate to low quality, and that's me being abundantly polite. The unfortunate reality is, when it comes to the live service attempts of a lot of studios, especially in AAA, the quality, or lack thereof rather, have led to core audiences losing so much faith in their work that this is the kind of reaction you could expect from an unfortunate amount of people. 
when I started my my old job at THQ, uh, the guy I sat down next to, he said, I have faith in three game companies, the three B's, Bethesda, Bioware, and Blizzard. <laughs> And the funniest part about that clip is it's from 2014. Imagine the way what? someone would react if you said you had faith in three Bs oh, today. <laughs> but I bring that clip up because once again, it's from 2014. That's pre-Anthem, pre-Fallout 76, pre-Overwatch 2, and Diablo 4. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not gonna make this video. I kind of decided I wasn't gonna make negative videos like this, but I did have the script written. And looking back, wow, I forgot. <laughs> this was such a bad gaming experience for me. I was so unhappy. <laughs> but the fact that the game was live service was not necessarily the problem with Diablo 4 or Fallout or Anthem. A good live service game delivers reliable, ongoing, and varied fun with frequent updates to keep things fresh. But a great live service game does so while also providing some of the fun you get from traditionally full price titles in the form of things like nuanced gameplay, a, a gripping narrative, impressive visuals, breathtaking music, and a wealth of content and experiences available without the player feeling like they're being nickel and dimed or their time is being wasted. And the best live services manage all of that while balancing player friendliness and motivating player spending. It's the trade-off we all sign up for with live services because development is ongoing and expensive, so of course money has to keep coming in from somewhere, and I think most reasonable people understand and accept the gameplay inconveniences that come with that. But the problem is, with a lot of games like these, is they don't really live up to their end of the bargain and wind up feeling more like the priority is less on the game, less on providing that digital third place, than on providing a platform for the storefront attached. And at times, that's probably exactly what's happening. I mean, Lord knows Warner Bros. is not doubling down on live services because they genuinely believe that's the best approach to making quality gaming experiences. They're trying to get that GTA money. But here's the thing about Warframe. Having been around for the ride since the beginning, I've seen digital extremes put their money where their mouth is when it comes to making it clear that at the impressive degree that the health of the game and the happiness of the community are at all times a priority. When we first designed Kubros, or myself, when I first came up with the Kubro idea, um, we wanted people to be able to change the, the fur pattern and colors. So we had a lever, uh, basically, for all intents and purposes. It was a button you could push and it'd be like, oh, if you want to pay, I can't remember what it was, so much platinum, you could change the color. And then you could, you know, you could take an imprint of that and you could trade it to someone else. So it wasn't, you know, like, we're trying to give you a way to like, you could get something cool and then you could give it to your friends. And we saw, you know, a guy pulled the lever like 200 times. And it's just like, oh my dear God, what have we done? We've made, you know, we've created a slot machine. Right. Uh, and so, you know, it was a couple of days. I think it took us to take it out, yeah. a day, day and a half. That one is a big regret. Obviously that was insanely profitable mm, right. for someone to be doing that, but that's not what our design intent and that's not what the intent of the game is. So that's why it was, you know, that's why we changed it. When you're dealing with something that is, does have a, a you know, kind of a cash component, you have to really be careful. Like, and here's the thing about the gaming industry. In my opinion, there are very few surprises when it comes to the general output of most larger studios or publishers once they've made it clear who they are, what their goals are, and what they'll do to achieve them and what they will or will not compromise in the process. BioWare was having problems way before Anthem. The writing was on the wall long before Fallout 76 dropped. And if anyone is surprised about what's happened to Overwatch 2 or Diablo 4 in the wake of Bobby Two Horns, I've got a bridge to sell you. And I really don't wanna reignite World War III Warframe versus Destiny in the comments. I love Destiny. I've also played that since launch. I've made such incredible friends because of it. I talk to them all the time. But if you've been paying attention to the game for the past decade, last year's events were so hilariously predictable. I don't know if anyone knew it was going to be this bad, but like, once again, the writing was absolutely on the wall. Veil Containment was one of the most management-centric, engagement-brained, design decisions I've seen in my entire life, and whenever Bungie starts acting like that, which they were like before Lightfall to be clear, the Lightfall era was just kind of confirmation they were really full sending this time round, and <laughs> it was such a trip. The best way I can describe it is like a full year of kind of bemused dread at what was obviously coming next as I watched them drive to Home Depot, buy a fridge, shove Holiday in it, and mock 10. 
I was unironically about to start a Destiny site because I thought Sony would bring stability. And I do love the game. And then this happened. And I was like, never mind. Bad idea. Abort, abort, abort. I felt like Punxsutawney fucking Phil because I enjoyed Lightfall. Strand is dope. But I'd be lying if I said Lightfall didn't also cast a heck of a shadow because Lightfall was their moment to course correct. But they clearly had no plans of doing so. And whenever Bungie starts trending in that direction is when the game starts falling off and people start leaving. Not immediately. It's always a slow bleed. And of course, as as per usual, it's only after they almost lose the entire player base that Bungie will powwow and management will seemingly get out of the way for like five minutes and then the voice of reason in the company will buckle down and they'll come back with something hot to win players back and then and then Dado gets excited and then we all get excited because when Dado's happy, we're happy. Every few years, it's like clockwork. <laughs> when most of these companies tell you who they are, barring like substantial change at the foundational level, they will be shockingly consistent in the direction of their output. And I want to be very clear. I am talking about the companies, not the individual developers, who I am sure are both talented and passionate beyond belief and want nothing more than focus on making games we all love. But we all know talent and passion doesn't always win out, and in most cases, games don't fall so far short of audience expectations because of a want for talent. No, I think it has much more to do with how so many businesses in their greed, their arrogance, their impatience to make all the money all the time lose sight of their communities, their customers, and what we actually want. And it's not always management versus everyone else either. In my mind, the, the best games likely come from a balance of good business and good art, but here's what unchecked entropy without maintaining that balance causes. Imagine if you had two massive cruise ships, both traveling to the same destination thousands of miles away at the same speed. Relax, <laughs> no need for a panic attack, we're not setting up a math problem. But if one of those ships starts slowly drifting a couple of degrees off course, it'll be unnoticeable at first, but then thousands of miles down the sea road? I don't know anything about the ocean, it's an awful place full of monsters, I don't, I, I don't think they're called roads, I think they're called lanes, it doesn't matter. Anyway, point is, eventually all it takes is a small miscalculation, and then the two ships that were headed to the same place drift so far apart they can't even see each other anymore and if it takes too long for the captain to notice and of course correct it's very possible the two ships will never truly align themselves again part of the reason i think businesses are so consistent and at times very predictable is they really are like cruise ships and the thing about cruise ships is they aren't great at turning on a dime and i'm not about to sit here and say digital extremes doesn't pilot warframe with like a drunken sailor at times too like I said, companies tend to be consistent. Every few years, we are going to get something like Regal Aya or an heirloom pack. They're not gonna stop. This kind of stuff has been going on in the game's entire lifespan. DE is absolutely gonna keep trying us. And sometimes 100%, they will catch it themselves and course correct. And sometimes it will take community uproar telling them, hey, this really ain't it. You see, when Warframe is in its best state, it really goes out of its way to encourage you to have fun the way you wanna have fun. And we've only really reached this positive place because Warframe frame has truly grown alongside its community and the developers have put in a lot of effort when it comes to continually putting that community first in a lot of ways to the point where even if their ship drifts a little off course they never lose sight of us and they will find their way back as opposed to certain other scenarios where the captain might be asleep at the wheel perhaps getting woken up all confused bumping into stuff all like what do you mean the health of the crucible is important to the health of the game <laughs> Look, okay, Warframe has problems too. As much as I can talk forever about Destiny and Bungie's hiccups, I could also easily give an unprompted TED talk on Warframe's million other issues, from all the bugs, to how much FOMO is involved in the acquisition of endgame power, to how the game blurs the lines and doesn't even really try to communicate what actually requires platinum and what can be comfortably acquired through standard play. Like, I would not introduce a friend to this game without giving them a PDF laying out, don't buy this, don't buy that. I know when you click it, it says you need to spend platinum, ignore that, just go to Teshin, and if you don't know who that is, then you don't need that yet. But despite the game's flaws, over the past 11 years, Warframe has truly evolved, truly come into its own, whether we're talking about its narrative, its gameplay, or quality of life. And I think that's possible because of how, as a business, Digital Extremes is so committed to continually building upon Warframe's very strong foundations, while also accepting so many different playstyles, personalities, and interests. Whether you're hardcore or casual, whether you love space ninjas, space wizards, space cowboys, or space fairies, whether you love the grind or see it as nothing more more than a means to an end. Whatever you want to do, DE tries to be there for you, saying, hey, sure, go for it. And that applies to Platinum and the game's pay-to-win nature as well. 
when it comes to the term pay to win, people love their mental gymnastics and for good reason, I think. There's a lot of different ways to look at it. A lot of ways anyone can twist it so it doesn't apply to their favorite game and so it's really easy for any conversation to get bogged down in the specifics of the definition when in reality, I don't know how productive whipping out the Webster's is when it's a term that's way more subjective than some like to pretend. A lot of games heavily blur the lines, especially games like Warframe where the concept of winning is a bit vague for most people. After all, it is the kind of game rather explicitly, I think, designed around the fact that not every player will have the same goals. Winning in Warframe almost assuredly means something different for many of us. I mean, for example, I think shield gating is kind of lame, one-shotting everything gets kind of boring, and because I've been playing for so long, rewards aren't the priority so much as the time spent feeling meaningful. Winning for me is having fun with the grind, not grinding to have fun if that makes sense, and that all affects how I play and the kind of content I enjoy. <laughs> if I were a betting man though, I would wager there will be someone who opened the video then took the comments to say the concept of winning doesn't exist in Warframe, therefore it can't be pay to win. Probably saying something about how the game isn't competitive or fashion is the only thing that really matters. Like I said, the game welcomes all kinds of players and everyone is gonna have their own opinion and that's not just okay, it's one of the game's biggest strengths. But here's the deal. Warframe is a game where I can just outright buy end game gear, characters, and mods. It's a game with paid boosters for everything from experience to resources designed to remove a lot of the annoyance and grinding, and it's a game with severe limits on the amount of crucial gameplay upgrades you can earn without spending platinum at any given time. I love Warframe, but I can't personally look at it as anything but pay to win, when in order to effectively progress, in, in order to avoid the roadblocks, in order to consistently have fun, I constantly find myself needing to spend the premium currency. The thing is though, ninjas don't just play free. If we put in time, we pay free, and that's the best part. But the worst part is ninjas can, and will at times have to, pay for it so much in this game, and in a game about grinding in particular, personally, I don't love that the longer I've played, the more the game feels built around convincing me to pay to circumvent aspects of it. Because the grind is the game, and in my opinion, Warframe is in its best place. Warframe is the most fun when grinds are lengthy but productive in numerous ways, when items are rare but totally feasible to farm without excessive time getting attached, and when things are balanced so turning to plat is a solid alternative but truly an alternative instead of so often being the most reasonable way to get what you want without feeling like you wasted a ton of time. You see, Platinum is so easy to farm that in certain circumstances across the game it's genuinely a smarter, more efficient choice to buy what you want with Platinum instead of working towards it the quote unquote right way, and it does feel like Digital Extremes relies on it as a crutch to serve that exact purpose sometimes. And here's where that mind goblin comes back to say hello! Because I can get anything with Plat, it almost feels like cursed knowledge understanding how to earn that Plat quickly because now I know it it would only really take me a week, maybe two tops of farming, and I could just outright buy every single mod I need to shore up every single gap in the builds I'm working on right now. And the fact that I can do that somewhat devalues the experience for me, because why would I farm orc and vaults for a 4.17% chance at a mod instead of spending not even an hour, I mean maybe 30 minutes farming platinum instead? The flow of setting goals for yourself and working through the content to earn its rewards through meaningful effort and growing at a reasonable pace through engaging with all of the game's interconnected systems without feeling pressure to take shortcuts is where I have some of the most fun with Warframe. And Warframe just loses some of that fun once you reach the part of the game where so much of your progression, when so many of your goals will likely be best achieved through a cycle of farming plat and trading for items. Sometimes Warframe balances this pretty well. For example, I love how pity systems have been implemented in some places, like the new Entrati Disruption, allowing you to steadily work towards what you want if RNG isn't in your favor. And I love activities like Iso Vaults, where even if it may take a while to get precisely what you want if you're only aiming for one thing, while you're doing that, you're constantly earning rewards and progressing in so many other ways that the time spent feels valuable and you as a player can just focus on having fun. And I do think Prime Resurgence is absolutely an improvement over the old Prime Vault system since it allows us to access Prime gear on a much more consistent, more reasonable basis, even if it's not perfect. And I do really appreciate how newer systems like Arcane Dissolution are already kind of helping to address some of my issues by giving your constantly growing stockpile value outside of the in-game trading system, helping you build out your collection by playing and engaging with the game in numerous ways instead. But sometimes the grind is wholly out of step with the rewards, uh, if DE allows you to grind at all, and you just start drowning in this endless sea of timers and repetition, feeling like little progress is being made towards any of your goals, and every time that happens is when Warframe goes from unbelievably fun to mind-numbingly boring. 
and of course, I'm not saying everything needs to be farmable in a day. I mean, nah, I'm farming my tome mods myself. I'm in no rush. And when I got literally everything I needed to craft Dante in my very first disruption run, I was honestly a little surprised, almost disappointed. Because like I said, the grind is the game, and the grind being too quick isn't ideal for anyone either. If anything, this is me saying I would love it if we had more ways to grind more things in more places. If the game was even more interconnected, maybe if some isolated or time-gated rewards and resource drops were spread across some of our content islands to help the game feel less segmented. And I'm not saying DE needs to make it so that items can't be acquired with flat either, because as much as I'm not the biggest fan of the influence it has on the game sometimes, I do think it's impossible to ignore the benefits of Platinum when it comes to keeping the game as free and accessible as it is. When it comes to monetization, in order for free-to-play games like this to survive, I do think there does have to be a balance between player friendliness and motivating spending. If you're too player friendly, if there's not enough friction in your game giving people genuine reasons to spend, I, I think we all know what happens when a well-made game doesn't make enough money. By practically demanding you use Platinum by tying it to such crucial gameplay features, Digital Extremes motivates player spending by giving Platinum real gameplay value beyond simple cosmetics. They make sure you can never completely ignore or forget Platinum because if you're playing, you'll always need some at some point. That being said, they do keep the essentials very affordable. Even if you couldn't earn the in-game currency, these kinda aren't the worst prices in the world. And while I will always raise a concerned eyebrow whenever DE swerves off course, over the years I can attest, they really do focus on and try to maintain a respectable balance between the wants of the player base and the needs of their business. And I think what I've appreciated the most over the past decade is how comfortable DE is with owning their mistakes and working with the community to find a mutual understanding and a path forward that works for everyone when they can. How comfortable they are being so open and earnest, freely sharing their beliefs about the game and its future, and freely sharing so much of themselves in general. <laughs> they are absolutely a much bigger company now than they were years ago, and I have no illusions about the fact that they're owned by Tencent at this point, but Digital Extremes has retained a lot of their humility, a lot of their connection with the community, and I do think the current quality of the game and health of the player base reflects that. Obviously, they haven't always done a perfect job, mistakes have been made, and they will continue to get made. But regardless of what some people would have you think, arrogant members of the industry and loudmouth fans alike, game developers are just as human and just as fallible as the rest of us, and there's nothing wrong with that. Let's normalize it being okay to not be perfect all the time. In most circumstances, it's not malice, it's not laziness, it's probably not even necessarily greed, it's, it's life. If you fall in love with Warframe, odds are you'll be thinking about this number a lot. Thinking about how you're gonna pay for your next potato, or new inventory slots for that weapon you're crafting, or some item that you have no real way of grabbing otherwise. And yeah, that sucks, but honestly, I'd say the trade-off is worth it, as long as you don't lose sight of the fact that the trade-off is happening, and depending on the kind of player you are, it's a trade-off that may not always be in your favor, even if the game is pay to win, ninjas pay free, so I imagine it's hard for most people to be too mad at that. It's part of what makes the game so unique, and on some level, I'm sure, that's why it's fun. So. What's next? Look, okay, I know I've been gone a minute, and mostly because I've been taking care of my grandparents. We've had a tough year full of way too many hospital visits, but they're doing much better now, thankfully. Uh, but partially because well, before starting Why It's Fun, I really was about to start a Destiny site with a channel, the whole shebang. Cause yeah, I love the game, but even though I'm pretty confident Final Shape will be good, if I, and I don't think the game is going away anytime soon, and I've worked on and managed enough sites in my career to know what I was working on was like genuinely good it, it was something i would actually use but it just felt like a kind of dumb time to start anything new around destiny i mean if you see the titanic sinking just because you know someone will eventually tow it to shore and patch it up doesn't mean you should get on board until that actually happens right or or you at least have a timetable at least you know what i mean all that to say i started this channel really quickly i'm a big believer in taking messy action and that's exactly what this was and i didn't really have an idea what kind of content i wanted to make here but i figured it out now so here's what you can expect going forward generally speaking i'm not a reviewer don't want to be a journalist and i don't want to make multi-hour long videos complaining about games i hate either <laughs> i think there's enough of those out there uh, instead i want to find the fun in all games because i think there is fun to be had everywhere and i want to share how even if you love a good looter shooter sometimes if you take a step off the beaten path if you play outside of your comfort zone you'll find 
life-changing gaming experiences you may have otherwise never encountered. And the same is true of those players who might write games like Warframe off simply because they're live service looter shooters. I mean, when it comes to Warframe, vets, if we've got any vets in chat, back me up on this, right? I'm pretty confident that I could show most gamers who are into sci-fi, like a single song and then an elevator ride. And that would be enough to hook like 90% of people because it's better storytelling inside of like a couple of minutes than you'll see in 50 hours in a lot of other games, let's be real. I want this channel to be a place where you can swing by whenever you're looking for something new to play, a place where you can always find nuanced conversations about fresh and deeply, genuinely fun experiences like Warframe. And I want to celebrate those experiences for what they are. But just like I don't really want to be a reviewer, I also don't want to be a shill, because I'm not. Like everything in life, there's a balance, and I think most games have problems that get in the way of fun, even if they don't affect all of us. It doesn't make them objectively bad games, but it is what it is. So like today, we'll talk about uh, some of the things that make these experiences not so fun, because I've got goblins about that kind of thing for days. And how else am I supposed to focus on talking about how fire Star Rail is without first talking about how problematic the monetization and mechanics are? Some of my goblins, some of my gripes are pretty reasonable, like I hope I was today. I mean, let me know what you think. Uh, others, well, the video is long enough. We, we, we can save talking about how this Colgate nonsense could unironically mean I never buy another Spider-Man game uh, another time. But so I am kicking off the new year with this Warframe video. I know it's April. Let me live, OK? But after that, we'll be taking looks at different games every two weeks, knock on wood, and talking not necessarily about the features or lack thereof, but about the core reasons they're uniquely fun and worth your time. A lot of live service, a lot of not so live service, a lot of indie games. I mean, heck, the great thing about why it's fun is I can still talk about Destiny just without, you know, pigeonholing myself. So, hey, we'll definitely circle back to that at some point. I'm not going to lay out a precise schedule. I'm sure things will change, but I've got the next four videos basically already scripted out, and I, including one about twice this size, which if you're interested in the nuances of live service and the future of the industry, I know you won't want to miss. Uh, we're going to talk about the hard truths behind why, no, the industry isn't dying, no live service fans really aren't fatigued and yes taylor swift and from software are basically the same person <laughs> if that sounds up your alley stay tuned uh, i deeply appreciate all the love and support my videos have gotten so far it's way more than i expected and i'm more committed than you can possibly know to making this channel and if i'm lucky eventually this community a home for all of us where we can have nuanced discussions about the games we all love but more importantly a place where you know you can find fun i can't promise i'll respond to every comment life is still so busy i still likely won't be online much if at all and if i'm being 100 percent honest I, i'm absolutely more of a sean murray let me just put my head down and work kind of guy but what I can promise you is I will always read every comment and there will always be another video coming. It's just a matter of time. Thanks for watching and an extra special thanks if you stuck with it this far. Cheers and have a good one.